KFG, News Radio 580 and 94.9 FM. Your choice is simple. Join us and live in peace or pursue your present course and face obliteration. Everybody is crying and so upset, and it is the end of their world. And that's what's so uh, hurtful about this. How do we explain how this is possible? How did this happen? You're awake, by the way. It feels like the end of the world. You're not having a terrible, terrible dream. Also, you're not dead and you haven't gone to hell. This is your life now. This is the time for real wisdom. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Jim Polito. All right. I'm not only back in the saddle, but I'm back with my good friend, attorney Allison Cohen. And of course, your sister Melanie came and she decorated. So if you're watching Uncharted TV 3, I've got a lovely, uh, we would we say this is a red, white, and blue fedora. Totally. And I'm wearing it a la Frank Sinatra off a little bit and down a little right. bit. That's how Frank would wear it. But I don't look anything like Frank. I look like Frank Furter. <laughs> <laughs> Not Sounds Frank Sinatra. A and I you've got a fantastic. lovely red, white, and blue tiara yes. on. We are decorated in the studio with flags because one third of our government in our balance of power is about to change. Exactly. We have one of, one of the major deciding factors for people voting for Trump was the Supreme Court. Exactly. And now that we have a court that seems to be activist, it's very important from an ideological standpoint on both sides of the aisle. Everybody wants their person with their uh, judicial ideology that, that, that comports either as a conservative or a liberal, right. either a um, what did Scalia call himself? A um, he was a strict constructionist. Constructionist, yes. exactly. A textualist, right. right? As opposed to a swami who reads anything into the Constitution. Right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, let's start first of all. You you have the 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 two leading contenders, but let's start with how this is going to happen. Trump says next week. Um, you're going to have my my nominee. Right. Where do we go from there? So Article 2, Clause 2 of our Constitution, if you don't have one, you should get a copy. Yep. Uh, it's important to read it and understand what are the powers. Uh, what are the powers of the president? What are the powers of the Senate? That part of the Constitution says, of course, that the president can nominate with the advice and consent of Senate, ambassadors, ministers, consuls, judges of the Supreme Court, and of course, other officers of the United States, like all of the appointments that they're going through. Right. He nominates them. We have Senate hearings. They get confirmed. Same thing with the cabinet. Same thing with what we're having with SCOTUS. Uh, currently, right now, we have John Kelly has been confirmed, right? Yes. As Homeland Security. Homeland Security. James Mattis. Yep, Mad He's Dog. Con yep, confirmed his defense. Defense. We have Mike Pompeo, confirmed CIA. Yep. Nikki Haley, very important role, confirmed UN yeah. for the UN ambassador, and, and particularly important con considering the Israel and oh, the boy. UN conflict and everything that's going on there. And, yep. And let me just, for one minute, Jim, because this is important. So we know uh, with everything that's been happening since December 23rd, you, you've got... A real battle ahead of you uh, in terms of how do we, if we ever can, really establish peace in the Middle East. Yeah. Got 99.6 percent of the Middle East countries, which are Arab controlled, Arab dominated countries. Uh, yeah. I mean, the list goes on. You've got Mauritania, Morocco, Algeria. Uh, you've got um, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Yemen, Oman, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Lebanon. You've got Kuwait, Qatar, wow. Bahrain, United Emirates. This is why she's brilliant. Uh, Iran, Iran, Iraq, Egypt, Syria. I've run out of fingers. And that's 99.6% of the Middle East. 0.4% is Israel. A little okay? postage that stamp. That little teeny postage stamp. So yep. how do we look at that moving forward? That's something I'm going to be watching in terms of Nikki Haley. But turning to where we are now, when yep. Trump was first elected, uh, he had put out 21 candidates, I yeah. believe. Right. Well, he did it during the campaign. Yes. He said because he wanted to make it an issue. Right. Here are the type of people I will be looking for 
to put on the Supreme Court. I think that had held a lot of sway with voters and with people who were concerned about the balance on the court being upset. Right, exactly. And so we've had a situation now where we have been with eight justices Mm -hmm. for the past almost one year. Uh, Judge Merrick Garland, we know, was in the uh, was being held out there for almost 300 and something days before his appointment expired. The 115th Congress, once that was seated, his appointment expired. And from what we can see now, we have come up with at least what everybody is thinking is going to be the two nominees, Neil Gorsuch and uh, Hardiman. Thomas Hardiman. Okay. So Neil yeah. Gorsuch. Yes. Thomas Hardiman. Exactly. Now, wasn't there a third? Just a yes. and 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 you that person is kind of. Well, Thomas Pryor. Thomas um, Pryor. Yeah, and part of the uh, issue with him, at least from what I can see from the conservative uh, blogs and even the liberal blogs, is they're feeling like he might go ahead and. Uh, you know, precipitate some kind of a filibuster. And that could be problematic because some of his views are a little bit more extreme. Uh, some of his views, maybe not, but they look at him more as like a career politician in robes. Oh. And so I think that's part of the problem. So, uh, yeah. really, I mean, as much as William I... William I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say Thomas. William, yeah, William as, Pryor. As much as I made the... Um, I made the statement that it's becoming more of an ideological court. It's almost becoming politicized. Among true jurors like yourself, there still has to be a respect for the law. There may be differences on some interpretations, but there still has to be a basic respect for the law and a basic understanding of the broad law and the Constitution. And if you're going to behave like a politician... That's a different job. Right. It's like the difference between being a news reporter and a news commentator. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So I get that. And just so that we know now, the filibuster, and we're talking with Allison Cohen, Cohen Law Services, host of Legalese every Saturday at 11 o'clock on WTAG, but you can listen on WHYN if you get the iHeartRadio app, you folks in Western Mass. Um, Here's the thing. We found out that Harry Reid got rid of a lot of the filibuster for a lot of different things. Right. The only thing that they didn't get rid of the filibuster for was Supreme Court nominations, yes. right? Exactly. So this is what's interesting. So uh, if you look at what Harry Reid did, and this is very ironic because he did this in 2013. So the Democrats were really frustrated by the Republican um, obstruction of what they felt was the lower yeah. level federal court appointees. Uh, and then, of course, you know, everything that was going on with them. He steps in. Uh, he eliminates the rule requiring 60 votes right. to move a nominee to a vote to the full Senate. Yep. And so we believe that despite right now where we've only got four people that have been confirmed at this point, uh, and maybe despite, despite some strong controversies in some of the picks, it's probably going to sail through a lot more easily because of Harry Reid and what he did in 2013. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. Um, the Founding Fathers wanted the Senate to be more deliberative. That's why they run every six years. Right. The House was supposed to be the voice of the people. They run every two years. Right. The Senate was supposed to be like an upper house, more deliberative, more compromise. The the, uh, House was supposed to be react to what the people want right now. Right. Senate is no longer that. And and, and I mean, when you get rid of the filibuster... Um, Which is you have to have 60 votes for certain things to pass, which means if you control 50, if you're in the majority, you have 52, uh, you have to get eight people from the other party to join you and switch. Um, So let's go to those other two candidates. So the the, the one that we already discussed, there could be a filibuster there. That's what they're saying. Politician in robes. William Pryor. uh, And certain certain ways he was, he seems a little bit more moderate uh, with things on like the LBGT community, but Mm -hmm. they really are looking at him, and this is what they're saying, kind of that, you know, Republican politician in robes. I don't think that's going to fly. So let's turn to, first of all, uh, Neil Gorsuch, because as of maybe the last 24 hours, they're saying that they believe he 
may be, uh, in fact, the front runner. So he's from the Tenth Circuit. He was originally appointed by President George W. Bush in 2006. Oh, okay. Uh, he's turning 50 this year. Very oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. We got two young guys. Right. We're, we are yeah. not going to see someone. Yeah. Wasn't it always, Allison, historically, people appointed to the Supreme Court? They had had a lengthy career, yes. and this was like the cherry on the end of their career. They were in their 70s, yes. and then they'd be appointed, Exactly. but they'd be gone in a few years. They'd be gone in a few years, and I think what, obviously, Trump is looking for is somebody to stay on the court yeah. for a very, very long time. Well, and we've got, so right now, Roberts is 62 years old. Yeah. Kennedy is 80 years old. Wow. All right, let's go through this for one minute. Clarence Thomas, 68 years old. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, 83 years old. Oh, man, and she's got a lot of health problems. Yes, she does. Stephen Breyer, 78 years old. Samuel Anthony Alito, 66 years old. Uh, we've got Sonia Sotomayor, 62 years old. And then Elena Kagan is 56 years old. Yeah, she's young. Yeah. She was at Harvard and then right. um, came right out of there, appointed by uh, Scalia. Can't, goes all the way back to Reagan. Yes, Imagine that um, Reagan appointed Scalia. I know. Thirty years on the court. He was that long on the, and he was a young man when he when he started. He Very certainly young. was. So, so is Neil Gorsuch by all you know, ima- you know, terms of yep. what, what it means to be young for the Supreme Court. Turning fifty this year, he is a University of Oxford graduate, also a Harvard Law School guy, which is really in opposite to this um, Mr. Hardiman, which I will tell you in a minute, which I think is kind of nice. Uh, he. Let's see. He his opinions they say are really exceptionally clear. They're routinely entertaining. Reminds <laughs> us of somebody. Scalia right? was yes. very entertaining. Yes. Uh, they say he's a pleasure to read. He says exactly what he thinks and why. That's kind of nice. He is an ardent textualist. That's what they're saying. A, con- a strict constructionist, just like, like Scalia. Scalia, which yes. means he doesn't read anything into the Constitution. Right. He, you taught me his big thing, which was who decides. Right. And that's his thing. Okay, don't ask me this question if it's not in the Constitution. Right. And it's up to the legislative branch to do that. And there are those who believe, and I would say more liberal, that, oh, no, you have to interpret the Constitution. Right. Kind of like Scripture would be interpreted. Well, right. I, I don't things go in, Like that. the dormant Commerce Clause, in yeah. which it's not really there, but it's what Judges read into it to figure out, and really Congress, to figure out how they can control interstate commerce. Right. Anything, right, because it's up to the states, but the federal government tries to step in right. and say, oh, that's interstate commerce. We want that. Exactly. Allison, we got it. We have to take a break. We're talking with Allison Cohen. Um, don't worry. We're not going anywhere. We're just scratching the surface on what this Supreme Court is going to mean, what we can expect to see in the next couple of weeks, what it will mean for your life. We're going to get to all of that. Allison Cohen from Cohen Law Services. Don't go anywhere. This is the Jim Polito Show, your safe space. I'm Lisa Connor from the Hanover Theater. Join me every Thursday during Worcester News Tonight at 10 p.m. for the Hanover Theater This Week. Discover the magic of Broadway, music, and more at one of the world's top theaters, the Hanover Theater right here in Worcester. Showing some increasing volume on 290 eastbound, passing 122, looking at delays on 190 north at 140. I'm Jim Ryan, Price Chopper Traffic. If you see something out there, call the WTAG Traffic Hotline, 1-866-999-7200. Local news from Central Massachusetts for Central Massachusetts. Reporters in the field. And an in-depth local forecast. Worcester News Tonight on Charter TV 3. Good morning, everyone. This is meteorologist Tom Bavacqua. Lots of clouds around today. It'll be breezy. We have a chance of a rain or snow shower. High temperatures in the upper 30s. For tonight, cloudy. Low temperatures in the upper 20s. For tomorrow, still a lot of clouds around. Some bright intervals. High temperatures in the upper 30s. And the sun comes out on Sunday with temperatures in the 30s. And you can get your weather all day long on WTAG.com. Hey, it's Jim back here again. If you were injured in a car accident, would you call Joseph J. Cariglia? Absolutely. The insurance companies have lawyers on their side. You bet I want Joseph J. Cariglia on mine. Sure I would. Make one call, let them deal with all the hassles. It's a smart choice. You don't pay anything unless they win your case. If I were injured, I'd want all the help I could get, wouldn't you? Don't stand alone against the big insurance companies. Call the law offices of Joseph J. Cariglia. 
Health Watch is presented by UMass Memorial Healthcare. Here, caring for you. What is a birth defect and what causes them? A birth defect is a structural issue with the baby that occurred not because of birth, it occurred because a baby is developing in the mother's belly for nine months and something happened that created some type of structural injury to the baby. Uh, what causes them? It's, it's four major reasons. One is genetics, so something that you inherited from your parents or something that uh, develops spontaneously in your, in your genes. Uh, number two is a toxin exposure. Number three is a nutritional deficiency, something that you're supposed to get in your diet but, but didn't come through. And lastly, infection. Why should a woman seek a healthcare professional before pregnancy, and how can that decrease her risk of having a baby with birth defects? A lot of birth defects are preventable. So getting to see a healthcare professional even before you're pregnant can help you learn what things you should avoid, what things you should take, what ways you can make yourself healthy so that the baby can be the healthiest they can be. Why is taking a multivitamin important before and during pregnancy? One of the most major defects are neural tube defects, spina bifida, and those are occur, uh, occur due to a nutritional deficiency. So if you take multivitamins, if you take the right nutritional diet, uh, those can easily prevent not all, but almost all, of, the, of that type of birth defect. What should women know about taking medications during pregnancy? Taking medications is sometimes really important, but it's important to know that medicines that you take at different stages of your life, and especially when you're pregnant, may have different effects. And so you really want to avoid any unnecessary medications. That being said, if your doctor says that you need a medication for your health, it's most important that the mother stays healthy. When it comes to health care, one phone number is all you need to remember. 855-UMASS-MD. 855-UMASS-MD connects you to our network of more than 1,600 great doctors with expertise in every specialty for adults, kids, and babies. More doctors, more expertise, more locations. Wherever you are, we are there. UMass Memorial Healthcare. 855-UMASS-MD. Are you or someone you know struggling to keep your home warm? Worcester Community Action Council may be able to help. Money through the federally funded Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, commonly known as Fuel Assistance, are now available to help pay home heating bills. Whether you rent or own or heat by oil, gas, electric, wood, or any other heating source, assistance is based on the number of people living in your household and their combined income. A single household making up to $34,000 a year may be eligible. A family of four can be making as much as $65,000 and be eligible. Visit WCAC.net today. We're going through uh, what we can expect from the Supreme Court, um, and we're being told in a way that only Allison can present it because name of her show is Legalese. She makes it easy. Trust me. She's my attorney, too. If she can explain that stuff to me, she can explain it to anybody. So, Allison, um, we're going to get into cases soon. But do we want to wrap up on on these these folks? Yeah, I want to just finish. So Neil Gorsuch, uh, again, an ardent textualist like Scalia, he believes that criminal laws should be clear, that they should be interpreted in favor of the defendants. Very interesting. Oh. Interpreted in favor of the defendants, even if it hurts the government prosecutions. That was like Scalia. A lot of things that people don't know about the way the judges ruled in terms of the different areas like crimmigration uh, that we'll speak about with some of the cases coming up. Yeah. He is very skeptical, and I like this, of efforts to purge religious expression from public spaces. Oh, so, so was Scalia? Yes, I absolutely. Mean the, the, the Ten Commandments yes. are on the wall in the Supreme you Court. You got it. Right. You absolutely have it. So those kinds of things. Um, again, the dormant commerce clause, he's not enamored by it. We spoke about that. That's sort of the yeah. way that Congress can kind of get in the back door. Like, for example, when they went ahead and, you know, we criminalized marijuana, uh, you know, federally, but the states themselves, yeah. right, still have it so that many of the states it's legal in. Right. So it's sort of these backdoor things. Uh, he's not a big fan of that. He... I. I mean, as far as his religious beliefs go, I think when it comes to the cases like the Little Sisters of the Poor, you know, he'll support... For forcing yes. the Little Sisters yeah. of the Poor to pay for a yeah. abortion, birth control. Those, those, <laughs> those kinds of things, um, I, he, he would probably stand uh, a little bit 
with the religious groups to try and accommodate them yeah. to a certain extent. Uh, and so that's important to him. Let's turn quickly to the other, what they're calling now, because it's down to what we think is two, Thomas Hardiman. So Hardiman is an interesting one. First of all, he's not an Ivy League guy, which is kind of oh. nice, because everybody on the court we know all hails from an Ivy League school. They, they do. They're either Harvard, Yale, uh, and then Justice Ginsburg, who went to Harvard, then transferred to Columbia. But that's what we've got. This guy uh, is a graduate of Georgetown University. Mm -hmm. He drove a cab uh, that helped wow. him finance his... In D.C., he drove in, a in cab. In D.C., wow. that helped him finance his decree. Um, he is what they're calling an originalist approach to the Second Amendment right to bear arms because he kind of asks a question as to what is the... Who is it supposed to protect, actually, the Second Amendment? He said, is it supposed to protect the weapon or the person, or the activity. So they're calling that a little bit of an originalist wow. in terms of how he is interpreting it. But yeah, Second Amendment is a big thing for him. He also is less sympathetic to free, free speech claims. Uh, there was a case in which he ruled on in uh, where there were students who wanted to be able to wear silicon bracelets with the slogan, I heart boobies, uh, as breast cancer awareness. I think we, yeah. we talked yes, about we did. this. Yeah. And he, and Hardiman, who was sitting on the court, he said, listen to me, this is really inconsistent with the First Amendment. Uh, you know, he looked at it and he said it shouldn't be in schools, particularly because it was in a middle school context. Yeah. He thought it was, you know, it could fall into this gray area between which speech is, uh, you know, lewd and and you know, free speech, you're always kind of measuring that to a certain extent. So the Supreme Court had denied the school district's petition for review, and so it was left there, and they couldn't, you know, wear those bracelets Right, because we school. had a tie. Yes. No, it, yeah, no, they didn't even accept it for review. Oh, they didn't even they didn't accept, even accept it, for it for review. So that decision still stands. The but lower should, court did it, yeah. and that was it. It was and a year done. Right, and so he is showing you a little bit about how he thinks about free speech uh, and when is it going to be, you know, restricted to a certain extent. Interesting. You know, right. that's very interesting because a lot of people feel, well, wait a minute, speech in a school, public school, the school is an arm of the government. Right. The government can't suppress free speech. Right. But yet, the argument always against that, isn't it? And help me if I'm going out on a way too far on a limb here, is when they begin to talk about, well, what's the community standard and is that uh, what's the community standard but the you know, the ultimate part that we're always thinking about is this idea like James Madison the separation between church and state yeah so how do we weigh that how do we weigh that in uh, places that receive public funding like right. schools uh, he right. also he was he waited in a lot of these religious cases in which there were lawsuits filed by inmates who contended that their exercise to religion had been restricted by the prison officials we talked about one of those cases remember where uh, the guy wanted to keep his hair long yes yes and they didn't want to you know he was a practicing Muslim he wanted to not right. cut his hair but they were worried about the fact that it might have been some way to you know conceal contraband exactly so on those kinds of cases he generally rules in favor of the prison officials. So he is, again, you know, I mean, he's sort of a little bit mixed in terms of, you know, what his approach is to uh, religious issues. Uh, if they're restricted for good cause yeah. in that circumstance, he would be ruling with the prison officials. So oh. interesting. So these are our two guys. Right. Now, we got to get to a break, but let me, right. let me force you out on a limb. Yes. Who do you think is more like Scalia? Or do you think they both have equal but different attributes of Scalia. No, I think Gorsuch is more like Scalia, but I think Hardiman is going to be the pick. You do? I do. You heard I it. I do. You heard it, folks. This is where we break news. Okay, I'm with Allison Cohen from Cohen Law Services, also host of Legal Ease. In the next half hour, the cases. Now you know the players. Now let's get to the cases. And we all know that Supreme Court cases... In the past, we didn't pay attention to them. Now they make a big impact on our lives. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to The Jim Polito Show, your safe space. Hi, my name is Sarah. This is Boston, and he's available at the Worcester Animal Rescue League for adoption. He is a six-year-old pit bull mix. He has to be the only love in your life, so no other animals, and adults only for him. He's also completely obsessed with tennis balls, so if you like to play fetch, he's your man. At 
Atlantic hockey rivals square off as Robert Morris visits Holy Cross tonight at 7 on Charter TV3. And a fly that's driving me absolutely insane. It's just a little fly, and I want it to be a dead fly real soon. So I'm going to, if you see me swatting, but I got to get the right angle, and I can't get the right angle, uh, but I will. Now, I'm sure I will get emails from the fly lovers of the world that they serve a purpose. What purpose, I don't know. They are disease-ridden little creatures that God put here to aggravate. Tune in to De La Page and Friends, a Valentine's special crooning for Cupid here on Charter TV3. And the way you look tonight. I thought of you, my love. That's all. Hi, Henry Kamasi here from Kamasi Masonry Supply, your home for hardscapes. With retail stores in Worcester and Charlton, we display everything from pizza oven and granite benches to natural stone and drivable grass. Our hours are 7 to 4, Monday through Friday, Thursday nights till 6, and Saturdays 8 to 12. And check us out on the web at kamasi.com, where you'll find coupons for our newest products that will help save you money on your next home project. Hi guys, Anthony Latore, General Manager here at Patera Nissan. Come on in today and see me so I can show you a better way to buy a Nissan. We always have the lowest prices passing on huge savings to you. Come check out the newest Nissan has to offer from one of our certified sales professionals. The new 2016 Rogue drive home today for just $29.83. The Ultima 2.5S, lease for just $49 a month or buy from just $18,983. Patera Nissan, a better way to buy a Nissan. Route 20, Auburn, Massachusetts. New TAG Newsroom. The state senators in the area were pretty much split on the 40% pay raise issue. Democrats Ann Gobi and Michael Moore voted against it. So did Republican Ryan Fatman. Harriet Chandler and James Eldridge voted for it. The measure passed 31 to 9. The governor's already said he'll veto it. The Fed won't underwrite the cost of those expensive AP exams anymore, leaving many in the Worcester school system with some tough decisions. That's concerning for me, especially if for gateway cities where students really can't afford uh, to pay for that test. School superintendent Maureen Benenda says the Fed's decision leaves poorer communities in between a rock and a hard place. She'll be looking for more funding uh, for the 1,900 students affected. Kirsten Hughes is going to continue as the chairman of the Massachusetts Republican Party. Party State Committee re-elected her to another two-year term. For breaking news, it's News Radio 580 and 94.9 FM WTAG, your news, weather, and traffic station. Hi. In our hearts, the music lives on. And in our memories, the king is not forgotten. Elvis lives. The ultimate Elvis tribute artist event. The icon lives on and proves he's still the king. Live on stage, Elvis lives. Coming to the Hanover Theater Tuesday, January 31st. Get your tickets now. From the WTAG Price Chopper Market 32 Traffic Center. 190 northbound sluggish passing 140. We're looking good. Other than that, I'm Jim Ryan, Price Chopper Traffic. If you see something out there, call the WTAG Traffic Hotline. 1-866-999-7200. Local news from Central Massachusetts for Central Massachusetts. Reporters in the field. And an in-depth local forecast. Worcester News Tonight on Charter TV3. everyone. This is meteorologist Tom Bavacqua. Lots of clouds around today. It'll be breezy. We have a chance of a rain or snow shower. High temperatures in the upper 30s. For tonight, cloudy. Low temperatures in the upper 20s. For tomorrow, still a lot of clouds around. Some bright intervals. High temperatures in the upper 30s. And the sun comes out on Sunday with temperatures in the 30s. And you can get your weather all day long on WTAG.com. We do three hours of mental health. I give everyone an opportunity to get everything off of their chest, to express themselves, get rid of all their frustration, 
And if you're really whacked out and off the wall, I even give you a chance to come on the air. Please or thank you. I'm going to drag you into the men's room and wash your mouth out with soap. Tell you what, I've got great representation today. I have my attorney with me. So everybody watch out. Allison Cohen is with me here from uh, Cohen Law Services. If you're watching on Charter TV3, she has a lovely tiara on. She got me a lovely fedora. Actually, her sister Melanie got me a lovely red, white, and blue fedora. And I look like Frank... Not Frank Sinatra, Frank Chooch, we would say in <laughs> Italian. Um, but we're talking the Supreme Court, which is no laughing matter. And so Donald Trump next week will make his decision as to who he wants to nominate. Allison, you feel it's... I feel it's going to be Thomas Hardiman, Massachusetts-born Hardiman, uh, first person in his family to go to college, went to the University of Notre Dame, financed his law degree at the Georgetown University Law Center by driving a taxi. That's kind of nice. But there's a whole bunch of other folks on the other side feeling it's going to be this Neil Gorsuch. He's supposed to be a very handsome man. And, and apparently and that's something that, you know, people are reportedly saying that, that Trump well, likes. Well, Trump but, likes you to wear a dark suit. Yeah. Nothing but a dark suit. Right. And, uh, yeah. So, okay. And he's a Harvard Law guy. So that that fits with the makeup of the court. Right. Uh, which is why I'm kind of leaning towards Hardiman. It would be nice to see a different no, a representation. Different, different representation. A little bit more diversity. So, all right. Current status of SCOTUS. Where are we today? Yeah. Cases argued so far to date, 33. Is that, where, where would okay, that so be? Okay, so the term a... starts in October. Yep. 7,000 petitions are filed every year. I know. Uh, between 100 and 150 cases are accepted to be heard by the Supreme Court from October through the final, what we call our Super Bowl, in June. Right. Yep. So yep. thus far, we've had 33 cases argued, nine cases decided. Two summary reversals and then 72 more cases that are being set for argument. Now, this is important wow. because this brings us to this idea of how long does it take to get a justice nominated? Right. And we've spoken about this before. If you look at the averages, uh, and we ran a little bit of the numbers here, since Reagan, it's been about 68 days. Now, you've had people that I've gotten, obviously— confirmed in a lot less time from the time they've been appointed. You have uh, some people that you might not even heard of, so we won't go over them. But first woman, Sandra Day O'Connor, 33 days wow. to confirm her. I remember that. Um, under Harry Truman, Fred Vinson was 14 days. You've got William Brennan, though, was very famous for the Brennan Court, 64. Uh, Thurgood Marshall, first African-American, 78 days. William Rehnquist, 49 days. Antonin Scalia, who this justice will be replacing, God rest his soul, 85 days wow. for confirmation. So if we look at the average of 68 days, Jim, they appoint next, they, they nominate next week. Yep. Uh, it goes to the Senate. They debate it. They go through it. They hold the hearings. 68 days is going to bring us into April. Right. The, the right. first, yeah. first, maybe second week in right. April, depending. So, so what it looks like to me that they're doing is they're holding back a lot of the more important cases that they feel really have are going to have an impact. Because if a justice doesn't sit to hear the case, they can't rule on it. Right. They have to be there. You got it. So okay. I've picked out some of the cases that I think might be held on the back burner. Oh, until good. we go ahead and we get this new justice uh, appointed and confirmed by the Senate. Again, my bet is it might be Hardiman. Uh, we'll see. Might be Neil Gorsuch. But one of these two justices potentially will be confirmed and they will be listening to some of these cases. So I'm going to go into the first one, which is Lee versus United States. And we talked about this last time, Jim, this area of crimmigration. Yeah, crimmigration, yeah. which is a new term in law. Yes, right. exactly. And I love it. Because it sounds good. Crimmigration. It is kind of good. It's kind of it, like irrigation, but it's, it's crimmigration. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Okay, so 
Sixth Amendment, which we haven't talked about a lot, really has to do with how do you have you have a right to a defense, okay? Yep, I do. And what kind of defense do you have a right to? Is it supposed to be a meaningful defense? Is it supposed to be somebody that's competent, that is actually representing you, that knows what they're doing? So this is a case, and let me just tell you the facts quickly because I don't want to get into too much of the law, right. um, where you had a criminal defendant. He had argued that his attorney's performance was deficient because he had been convicted for a couple of offenses in which the guilty plea that he was going to enter, he was told by his attorney that if he enters this guilty plea, then he will have no chance of deportation. But that was wrong. Oh. Uh, that was wrong, yes. I would have even known that. Yeah. I mean, that attorney should have known the that. The attorney that... should have known that. So now you've got an, an understanding as to, okay, well, how do we look at this? Um, it's unclear in terms of our national interests, uh, of course, in terms of our interests of justice. Do we exile, and this is what the one of the arguments are, do we exile somebody who is really a productive member of the society to a country he hasn't lived in since childhood for committing a relatively small-time drug offense? Now, so this is is someone yeah. who is legal or yes. on a green card? Yes. No, they uh, on, on, yeah. they're, they're yeah. on a green they're card? They're on a green card. And they came in and they— Okay, he, so they came yeah. in the right way. Yes, they came in the right way. Um, and, but he ended up going ahead and he committed a couple of offenses. Uh, and they went ahead and they charged him. And the courts, they sent it to the court. Uh, they found him guilty. It went up. And now they're saying, well, they didn't find him guilty. He pled guilty. They're saying, well, let me ask you something. If your attorney told you that you pled—if you pled guilty to these minor offenses that you would have no problems with your immigration status, yeah. uh, but in fact you do, and now you're getting deported. How will the court look at something like that? Because this crim immigration area is growing. That that's an interesting case, right. obviously. Now right. I I would want someone even on a green card. I'm sorry, out. Drug offense, out. Uh, some other type of thing, maybe not. Drug offense, you're out. We don't need you. You were on a green card. You want to become a citizen? Sorry, right. I can't have you. Right. But the point is. He got bad advice. He got bad advice. So how do we determine what ineffective assistance of counsel that's is? Very, that's interesting. Yeah, the circuits are split, and you know how do we get to the Supreme Court, not down When 95? there's a disagreement between the circuits. You got it. So that one, Trump's guy or gal, if, 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 if it's a dark horse, could— would have to rule on this one. Exactly. And my feeling is, if it was either one of these, they are going to side, I believe, with the government to a certain extent um, in this process of potentially removal, unless they really sort of look at the Sixth Amendment and say, you know, this was completely negligent on the part of the attorney. Yeah. They told him to plead guilty. Yeah. He pled guilty. Yeah. Right? So it's it's an interesting it's one. It's very you know, interesting. You're crossing it's, a, over. It's, it's a tough one. I feel, right. I feel for the guy, yeah. even though... Um, um, he he right. should be gone in other circumstances. Right. All right. Okay, so now let's turn to another one of these crimmigration cases because this is another one that's being held back. Really interesting, okay? You've got uh, Maslin Jack. I think that's how you pronounce it. Maslin Jack was a naturalized U.S. citizen. Uh, and during the naturalization process, uh, this person denied ever having given false or misleading information to a U.S. official in order to gain entry. But here's what happens. The husband of this woman, Massa Jack Racco, was convicted of two counts of making false statements on a government document for his failure to disclose that he had served as an officer in the Serb Serbian military. So mm. he, they fill up paperwork, uh, and he doesn't—they're not honest on their paperwork. Uh, they come in under a— uh, they were really in here for um, on asylum. Yeah, basically. because the Serbs and the Croats. You got yep. it. They were here on asylum. He applies for asylum. The wife doesn't disclose that he was actually, in fact, you know, part of the Serbian army. Oh. And they lie. Uh, it comes out, uh, and so they bring it to court, and the rulings are split. But for most of the circuits, it says that if you make a statement that is in any way, shape, or form false, that you are going to be deported. And yeah. it should, as far as I'm concerned, it should be that way. It's the same way, Allison, when 
you've worked with me on things and you say you're getting this, but look, you know, if anything you put it, that you signed to here is false, this agreement is null and void. Right. And and it should be the same. It's the exact same principle that we all live with every day. Right. And of course, you know, their attorneys are arguing that, you know, a naturalized citizen has as much rights as any other citizen. Uh, they have enriched all areas of our national life, including business, government, law, science, and politics, all of these things. But again, it was a false statement on the application. Now, the question comes down to, was the statement material or immaterial? Half the courts say, if it was immaterial, that's good enough for us. We don't care if it was a material, a really you know, important statement or just a, a lie, essentially. If it's a lie, we're deporting. Yeah. Other halves of the states say, no, it's got to be a material false statement, something that's absolutely important to the application process for them seeking asylum. Now, well, now look. Yeah. Well, right. Look at the Tsarnaevs who right. came here, who right. became the Marathon Bombers. What if someone comes here, they were involved in terrorism, they don't disclose that. Maybe they're not going to be involved in it here, but still, should we be allowing someone like, if we find out that they lied on their application, right. should they be allowed to stay? I say no. Right. And Justice so, Polito says no. Justice Polito says no. And I have a feeling that uh, both Gorsuch or Hardiman would, in fact, rule in favor of uh, the government on this one to yeah, say that good. if you have lied on your application process and, you know, they say it was not material, at least that was part of the ruling of the court, but he served in the Serbian army. That was I a mean, vicious civil war, a bloody yes. and nasty war. Right. All so, right. interesting. Got, Again, crimmigration. Crimmigration. Well, we got to go to a quick right. break, and then we'll have a little bit of time left with Allison Cohen from Legalese every Saturday at 11 o'clock on WTAG. Western Mass, you can listen with the iHeartRadio app. And this is the Jim Polito Show, your safe space. Catch all the excitement with Dan Kenny and the Go Fish crew on Saturdays at 6 a.m. For more information about the show, go to www.gofishdan.com. I'll take this just about any day. Problems to report. I'm Jim Ryan, Price Chopper Traffic. If you see something out there, call the WTAG Traffic Hotline, 1-866-999-7200. Come to the New England Fishing and Outdoor Expo, January 27th through the 29th at Boxborough Regency Hotel and Conference Center. Tickets just $10. Children 12 and under get in for free. For more information, visit anyfishingexpo.com. Good morning, everyone. This is meteorologist Tom Bavacqua. Lots of clouds around today. It'll be breezy. We have a chance of a rain or snow shower. High temperatures in the upper 30s. For tonight, cloudy. Low temperatures in the upper 20s. For tomorrow, still a lot of clouds around. Some bright intervals. High temperatures in the upper 30s. And the sun comes out on Sunday with temperatures in the 30s. And you can get your weather all day long on WTAG.com. This is a... On Friday, January 27th, high-energy cover band Jackrabbit Slim debuts at G-Bar at 62 Green Street in Worcester, playing all your favorite classic rock, alternative rock, and top 40 hits at 9 p.m. Don't Let Go, a tribute to the Jerry Garcia band, will be trucking to Electric Haze at 26 Millbury Street in Worcester on Friday, January 27th, with special guest Nick Swift from Barely Dead. Clada at 399 Canal Street in Lawrence welcomes Southern California rock band Eve Six on Friday, January 27th, playing their hit singles Inside Out, Here's to the Night, and more at 6 p.m. And the Ed Sullivans will put on a really great show Chew at JJ Sports Bar and Grill at 380 Southwest Cutoff in Northboro on Friday, January 27th, playing music made famous on the Ed Sullivan Show and more. On Saturday, January 28th, Bill McCarthy will be playing at Barber's Crossing North on Route 12 in Sterling from 8 to 11 p.m., playing classic and contemporary acoustic and not so acoustic rock and pop. Bruce in the USA will have you dancing in the dark at the Sinclair at 52 Church Street in Cambridge on Saturday, January 28th at 9 p.m. Come hear all your favorite Bruce Springsteen hits. No Alibi will be at the Marine Corps League at 181 Lake Gab in Worcester on Saturday, January 28th, playing Playing everything from 60s funk to modern rap as well as classic and modern rock at 9 p.m. And female-fronted cover band Squelch will be at Jillian's at 315 Grove Street in Worcester on Saturday, January 28th at 8 p.m., delivering hit after hit from classics to the current top 40. On Sunday, January 29th, join the Bull Mansion's brunch every Sunday from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. at 55 Pearl Street in Worcester with musical accompaniment by the talented Evan Langley. And the Blue Plate Lounge at 661 Main Street in Holden will hold their Sunday jam on the 29th from 3 to 7 p.m. All types of music are welcome along with this week's feature band, Raven Blue. For all you Central New England musicians and comedians out there, submissions for the 2017 season of WooTube are open now. So don't delay, get your video submitted today. 
That rhymes. Yes, it does. That's awesome. <laughs> Simply send your online video link to WooTube at Charter.com for a chance to promote your music or comedy on WooTube next year and have it seen for free in over 180,000 households in central New England on Charter TV3. This is Lisa Condit, and welcome to the Hanover Theater this week. Winner of eight 2012 Tony Awards, including Best Musical, the truly original Broadway experience, Once the Musical, is coming to our stage February 2nd through the 5th. Filled with an impressive ensemble of actors who play their own instruments on stage, Once tells the enchanting tale of a Dublin street musician who is about to give up on his dream when a beautiful young woman takes an interest in his haunting love songs. Head over to our Facebook page to enter for a chance to win tickets to see this unforgettable story about going for your dreams and the power of music to connect all of us live on stage. Once draws you in from the very first note and never lets go. For a full list of shows, visit thehanovertheater.org, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and sign up for our emails to receive the latest information about new shows, contests, promotions, and more. See you at the theater. Worcester, a city defined by a heritage of innovation, fortitude, and caring. Where the community is diverse and full of promise. Unibank is proud to introduce Invest Worcester. A savings account that reinvests deposits into home ownership, small business, and community development. While earning a premium rate of interest, help invest in Worcester's future. Unibank. Unibank. Together, we can build a better Worcester. As many of these cases and as possible okay. that this new justice, whoever it is, will be deciding. Exciting stuff, Jim. Uh, for me, I'm a kid in the candy store, as I always <laughs> tell you. Okay, so quickly, the Employment Retirement Income Security Act, which protects employees from losses in their uh, retirement plans. Obviously, it's put in place. You have to qualify for ERISA protection. Church plans are exempted, Jim. They don't want entanglement of government religion with regulation. This is the Really? Separation. So if I yeah. work for the church and I have a retirement plan, I don't have the same protection you as if it. I do with WTAG, WHYN, iHeartMedia. That's exactly right. They can do whatever they want. They're not governed by ERISA. So you've got uh, a group of plaintiffs. They come in. Uh, they work for Advocate Healthcare. Advocate Healthcare operates hospitals and inpatient and outpatient treatment centers. They were formed in 1995 uh, because of a merger of two religiously affiliated hospital systems, uh, neither which are financially operated by a church. So the question in that case really comes oh. down to how long, how far do we extend it? Okay, is it just church-owned organizations, or can they just be affiliated with the church and then move themselves out from underneath the, the ERISA protections or the ERISA exemption? So there's wow. a lot of regulations with ERISA too. So remember, no, the I church does that. not want to be bogged from, down. Yes, okay. Yeah, when I did uh, employment health insurance. Yeah. Okay, so again, do church plans apply when the plan is maintained by? a different kind of qualifying church-affiliated organization. And why is that important? Because tie that back to the Trinity Lutheran Church of Columbia case, Jim. Oh, we I discussed remember, yeah. this, right? Neither one of these cases have been set for oral argument, meaning that they're being held back particularly for a reason. So Missouri, remember that, uh, the playground place, right? They applied to purchase the recycled tires. Uh, the state rejected the application because the Missouri Constitution forbids public funding of churches. And so the Trinity Lutheran Church was arguing, look, this is discriminating against us based on religion. It's a violation of the Federal Establishment Clause. Mm. It's excluding churches from eligibility for general grant programs. And so that case is also being held out. Yeah, they um, want to build a, they wanted yes. to build a playground. Right. But they're a church group, yes. and they were looking for getting these recycled tires. A general tires. grand fund, yeah. right. And they, and they struck it down. That's at the Supreme Court, too. Um, wow. And then the final thing is Gloucester County versus School Board. Remember the case with the gender, uh, the oh, bathrooms? Oh, yeah, transgender, Okay, the yeah. transgender, and then you had the Department of Education. They issued a, an opinion letter to the schools uh, saying that basically they're permitting uh, same-sex bathrooms. Uh, there was a big entanglement that happened. Uh, the residents of the county were upset about it. Uh, and they didn't the, want to, yeah. And the, what do they have to decide. So it's, they're going to decide, first of all, whether or not the uh, Department of Education actually has the authority to issue that kind of opinion letter. About that. Yes. You have to do that transgender yes. bathroom. Allison, we got to wrap right. it up. This has been fantastic. We could go on for hours. But tomorrow, Legalese, Allison Cohen on WTAG at 11 o'clock. You can listen with the iHeartRadio app. Allison, I love you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jim.
All right, folks, please take a moment to think about the men and women of this country. Wear the uniform, wore the uniform of those who made the ultimate sacrifice in that uniform. Be nice to our men and women in blue. They're being asked to do an impossible job, and we'll be back Monday morning from what could be the greatest state in the union if we could stop the legislature from taking $85 million for a raise. I wish I was in Tijuana. Commerce Bank's new platform.